Okay, sorry about that, you all. We normally have theme music, but something happened with the sound system. So good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. It is my pleasure to be here with you all today to share some of the highlights from today's city council, from today's city council meeting. First of all, I'm pleased that the city council has approved um, our new budget director, Ms. Annette Guzman. Um, Annette comes to this role after serving as budget director for Cook County. Uh, where she oversaw the county's budget and the distribution of COVID-related financial aid during the pandemic. Uh, previously, previously, she served as a deputy assessor in the office of the Cook County Assessor, as well as deputy chief administrator and chief of staff for COPA. Um, for the last 15 years, her leadership and her experience in finance and operations as a project man manager, um, her experience in law, uh, she is quite accomplished and incredibly dedicated and is certainly ready to fill this role. I've had the unique privilege and honor of having served uh, alongside of her on the other side of the building, and I'm extremely confident that Annette will successfully oversee the city of Chicago's budget and uphold my administration's commitment to investing in people. I look forward uh, to our work together as we work to achieve a vision that is sustainable, a vision that ensures that our communities thrive, to make sure that we have responsive services, particularly for our children and our most vulnerable. And of course, the budget has to reflect the interests of all the people of the city of Chicago. So thank you, Annette, for answering the call and congratulations. Yeah. Now, of course, next I am proud to share that the city council also approved the Urban Agriculture Business License Enhancement Ordinance and I'm certainly pleased to stand here with all of our community partners. Mr. Anton Seals, Mecca Bay, Grow Greater Inglewood, Roger Cooley, Chicago Food Policy Action Council. Congratulations to you all. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you. And so, of course, from the state, we're grateful to have Takari Howard, Illinois Department of Agriculture, and my long um, time friend that I've served together when I first got into politics, working for the Senate President, Don Harmon, Rob Barron, who's in the Lieutenant Governor's office. Thank you both for being here today. Um, from the city, we have Ken Meyer, Yumi um, Grisby, Gr Grigsby, sorry, Deputy Mayor of Policy. We have Juan Bastian. Um, we have Ruby Ferguson, Adam Peterson. Um, if you are not aware, this ordinance uh, was introduced by the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protections and co-designed by the city's Food Equity Council. Um, this ordinance is working to ensure um, we effectively reduce the barriers that exist for growers to sell their produce to local neighborhoods or in local neighborhoods. Uh, with the changes in this ordinance, community gardens and urban farms that apply for and receive uh, produce merchant license are now able to sell whole, uncut, and unprocessed pr produce directly to their community from an on-site produce stand. This creates a pathway for viable business models while also providing access to healthy produce in communities across our city. Urban agriculture has the potential to create a more equitable and resilient food system in our city, and it allows us to provide healthy, abundant food options to our food insecure residents. I'm pleased that we, are able to, we were able to pass this ordinance today and begin addressing the needs and wants of our urban agricultural community. I thank the state, the city, community leaders who are standing with me for their work to increase food equity and promote thriving businesses in the city of Chicago. Our city's commitment to food equity will continue under my administration, and I look forward to partnering, partnering together to provide residents with fresh food and providing entrepreneurs with the wealth building opportunities. And finally, you all, um, today, the city council approved the landmark status for the warehouse a nightclub Ooh. that is considered, there you go, the nightclub that is considered the birthplace of house music in the home of house music, the city of Chicago, the soul of Chicago, Ooh. house music all night long. <laughs> <laughs> Our music scene, of course, is world renowned. Um, we have redefined genres alongside blues, gospel, jazz, house music is amongst the styles that define our incredible city. 
The warehouse is not only cherished by lovers of house music, but this space was a dance haven for the LGBTQ plus community in the 70s and 80s. So of course, it is fitting that this landmark approval comes as we celebrate Pride Month all throughout the city of Chicago. The warehouse was home to the legendary DJ Frankie Knuckles and everyone who celebrated there. So no matter how they've identified or where um, they're from, this was a place where we all could belong. And this is truly indicative of our city, a place where all are welcome. And we should always feel like we belong. I am proud to honor this important space, the landmark status, and I thank the city council for their approval. Thank you all very much. With that, I'll take one question. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon. Um, so to start, you know, the uh, um, I just wanted to get your reaction to these reports. The Tribune and Black Club have had reports about the migrants and about poor conditions in the shelters. It's been very expensive to uh, have these outside contractors running the facilities. Can you talk about the pl your reaction to those reports and also your plans going forward? Well, as you know, um, you know, a year ago, um, we had governors who were sending migrants uh, around the th around the country and the city of Chicago was one of those places where migrants were being um, sent and When I was sworn in May 15th, I believe there were almost 900 uh, newly arrival individuals um, who were Laying on the floor in police stations um, of course, there's been a great deal of um, contention because there was not a significant community process in place that allowed for voice to take uh, precedent and not just simply a reaction by government. And so I'm certainly aware of, of the challenges that I inherited and, you know, this is why I've made it a part of my everyday focus to make sure that we are decompressing the police stations and that we are providing a pathway to um, sustainable existence and living in the city of Chicago. You know, as far as the expense is concerned, unfortunately, there was, a, there was an, an agreement uh, with a particular institution um, that was not necessarily economically feasible. And so we have worked hard to renegotiate the contract and we're grateful that there has been some cooperation. Now, of course, long term, my administration is committed under the leadership of our first deputy um, chief of staff, Christina Pasion Zayas, who has done an incredible job of bringing people together, multiple stakeholders, the state level, the county level, the federal government, uh, many of our community based organizations to begin to establish um, more support for case management, as well as finding facilities that can adequately. Uh, support our newly arrivals. And then finally, what I will say is that this is also um, an important note that it is top of mind for me to make sure that the families who have been working hard to find safe spaces and affordable housing um, in the city of Chicago, that we're working with a level of expediency to continue to provide support for those families who are without, without homes. Um, as you know today, the city council um, voted um, to provide more opportunities for affordable housing, and we're going to continue to do that throughout my administration. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, this is another migrant question. Do you plan to uh, pursue the plan that started under Mayor Lightfoot to house migrants at uh, South Shore High School? And, and what do you say to people who are protesting that, who are asking, uh, why do you spend $51 million on migrants, but instead of investing that money in our neighborhoods? Yeah, well, first of all, Ted, congratulations on your um, tour around the city of Chicago, all 77 neighborhoods. Congratulations. <laughs> it's impressive. Um, you know, as I said before, it's important that we have a community process where voices are, are heard. You know, unfortunately, for too long, politics have established this zero sum game where. You know, people have lost at the expense of other people ostensibly winning. 
And so what I have done and I've charged my administration to do is to continue to have community meetings, whether they are in South Shore or Gage Park or wherever else, um, to ensure that there is a vibrant, robust conversation around what is the best pathway forward. And so my efforts are going to I'm going to continue those efforts to ensure that we are having direct conversations with the people of the city of Chicago that are ultimately impacted by these decisions. And I'm certainly not intimidated by those conversations, and I'm confident that the people of Chicago will do right by the people um, who seek to find refuge here in the city of Chicago, but that we're also being diligent to ensure that no one is um, unnoticed. What about the, the complaints about the, the spending? Why on migrants and not on neighborhoods? As I said before, that there has been historical disinvestment. But today is truly a testament of what we're doing for our urban farms and the agricultural industry that's not only creating jobs, but providing healthy food. As I've said repeatedly, there's more than enough to go around. It's just a matter of having the political will to do that, and today is an example of that. Thank you. Hi, Mayor. Hey. Your interim police superintendent said yesterday, quote, I'm never going to say we can't use more manpower, more resources. We're really working our officers to a nub. We're canceling days off all the time. Question, if you're not going to scramble to fill police vacancies, what can you do right now for your superintendent? Yeah, so what we are doing right now is that we're working collaboratively. It's a layered approach. Everybody knows that a police strategy alone is, is, is insufficient. It's a failure. And I don't know how you scramble to hire people, a process that takes 18 months. Do we really want to scramble to find police officers? I don't think we want to scramble to find anyone um, that requires a type of professional training um, that, that's needed in order to ensure that we are delivering adequate services for the people of Chicago. My approach has been multi-tiered, multi-pronged, that we have to have smart, very intentional, constitutional policing. There are roughly 56 beats where the violence is most likely to take place. One of those beats is where I raise my family. If I said repeatedly, no one has greater incentive for the city of Chicago to be better, stronger, and safer than someone who is raising their family in a beautiful community, but one of the most violent neighborhoods. As you know, that many corporations have stepped up. And they provide support and resources during the gap between when school was dismissed and when our park districts opened. That's an immediate response. Whenever we provide opportunities for young people, jobs, violence prevention interventions, those are immediate responses. And here's the neat thing, is that it's layered. My deputy mayor, Garion, um, has done an incredible job of working with law enforcement. Now finally, what I will say is, this is hard for everyone. We don't want to continue to see the people of Chicago harmed by the disinvestment, and we certainly don't want to see people harmed by the violence. And that's why I have worked with expediency, and I'm grateful that the philanthropic community are corporations who have raised millions of dollars to provide the type of immediate support that's needed, along with strategic policing, to do right by the people of Chicago. Now, let's not lose sight that we also have to make sure that we are dealing with the systemic problems that, quite frankly, um, had we addressed them 50 years ago, I, we wouldn't be in this same predicament. Remember when Lyndon Bain Johnson said, let's get at the root causes, and he called for a war on poverty? And President Nixon said no. And now here we are. We can do it right. We can deal with the immediate crisis, which I'm dealing with. But we also can deal with the systemic problems that have been ignored intentionally for over a generation now. Hello, Mayor. Hey, Craig. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about signs since uh, you, the proposal came up, or at least was mentioned on the uh, floor today. Can you say something about what the rationale is behind the vintage signs proposal that your uh, administration is proposing? I mean, a little bit, Craig. Craig I don't know if I can say it. Thank you for asking me to say a little bit. I mean, look, you know, um, there, there, there's a lot of historical. Um, dynamics that exist in the city of Chicago and what has happened is that you know vintage or historical signs have been um, not been permitted to exist because of course they need some upgrade right and so you know the intention to make sure that our signage is safe and strong and sound 
um, cannot come at the expense of, you know, removing the unique character that makes us the remarkable world class city that we are. So, you know, it's one of those dynamics, you know, I believe in throwback, you know, I'm, you know, from the 80s and 90s, apparently that's back in style. So I'm officially old school, Craig. I've, I've caught up with you, brother. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Hi there. Um, there's a lot of concern from Alderman today um, about the process for approving police-related uh, payments to settle lawsuits brought against the city. Um, what are your concerns about that process, and how do you plan to fix it, or can you fix it to ensure that the city isn't you know, paying tens of millions of dollars annually for these settlements? Yeah, well, first let me just acknowledge that, you know, there's unfortunately has been a a very damaging long history in the city of Chicago um, of brutality. Um, we have individuals that uh, were tortured, like severely beaten and harmed, and um, we're working hard to repair those damages. So we cannot lose sight that we still have a ways to go in order to ensure um, that blackness is not criminalized and or brutalized. Now, as far as the process is concerned, um, I think Alice covered me on the other side of the building. I was a part of the litigation committee where settlements were um, handled. Now, at the, at the county level, as you know, there are multiple ways in which people can access government, but it certainly has, there's risks, right? And whether it's the county hospital or the, the jails. And what I heard today was, is that there's an opportunity for us to um, embrace a process that provides more information in order for all stakeholders to uh, make more informed decisions. And I'm committed to working with our new corporate counsel once she's officially um, uh, uh, approved and voted on uh, to come up with the, a process as well as hear the feedback from the suggestions that have been already articulated so that we can have a, um, a process that um, you know, fully reflects transparency and openness. To the best of our ability, as you know, many of these cases are sensitive. So there are certain elements and dynamics that, as I experienced on the other side, where executive sessions um, were required and necessary in order to go a little bit deeper into um, the various cases. Thank you. Hi there. Um, can you give an update Hi. on youth hiring for the summer? You know, Department of Family and Support Services previously said there were 20,000 opportunities available, yet more than 44,000 people applied. Um, you've been trying to increase those opportunities. How's that effort going? How many additional positions will the city be offering? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, as I've said, you know, repeatedly that the best uh, thing that government can do is to invest in people, and particularly our young people. Um, you know, look, I, I believe the, the last time I looked at the, the applicants, it was almost 46,000 young people that have applied for a variety of positions throughout the city of Chicago. That's a remarkable testament to how much, how great of a need we have there, as well as the desire of our young people to, to be seen in, and to be invested in. Now, we've gone through every single um, department and our sister agencies uh, to look for positions. I believe we've come up with another 2,500 positions. But we're also asking, as you know, the business community to step up. Now look, many of them have. Many of them have made a commitment, not just for internships, but paid internships, and not just summer um, opportunities, but year-round programs. Um, it really is going to take all of us. The full force of government will be on display in the Johnson administration and working with the philanthropic community, working with the business community, as we all are invested in making sure that we maintain our status as the greatest city in the world, that I'm grateful that we have a number of corporations um, that have responded to the call, but we certainly need more. Thank you. Hi, Mayor. Hi. Building on that, do you see an end to the tipped minimum wage as a way to solve that youth employment crisis? So, you know, look, 
If individuals are going to be able to afford to live in the city of Chicago, we're going to have to have wages that reflect um, the, the, the cost increase uh, that is uh, creeping up on all of us. Um, and I'm grateful for the organizing and the work that has been dedicated and committed to making sure that there is some uniformity and some consistency and someone's ability to be able to make the ends meet. So I, I, I see any effort that we put forth as government to secure um, the economics for working people um, certainly places us in a far better position to have a sustainable economy. These are the same individuals that are sending their children to the schools, they're using public transportation, they're buying stuff, which I'm encouraging all of you all in the city of Chicago to buy as much stuff as possible. Um, you know, we've had, we have some in incredible restaurants um, in the city of Chicago. I mean, our culinary scene is just remarkable, second to none. So um, as we continue to lift up, you know, the full expression of our restaurant industry and quite frankly, all of our businesses, I mean, think about the advantages that we have now that we have the ability for um, growers to provide produce in their communities that, you know, this is going to open up a chain or a reaction that I believe is ultimately sustainable. So everything that we do uh, to protect workers, I believe, places us on a pathway to a better, stronger, safer Chicago. Thank you. How long should restaurants have to phase in the end of the sub-minimum wage? Should it be five years? Should it be three years? And then I have a follow-up question on something else. Okay. Um, that, that should be debated. You know, I, 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 I believe in democracy. Um, I, I feel like I have to constantly say that I'm not a dictator. And, and I, don't, I don't mean that in an adversarial way. What I'm, what I'm reflecting is the nature of who I am. I'm confident that when we, when we bring people together as a city, we can come up with solutions collectively that works for everyone. Again, no one should lose at the expense of someone else ostensibly winning. Um, so I'm happy to continue to have the conversations with um, those impacted, whether you are a worker, whether you are an industry, um, and then you have advocates and organizers and families that want to make sure that we have a process that is equitable and just and it speaks to the core values of the city of Chicago. And then 19 aldermen have signed a letter uh, complaining about Brian McDermott not being given an in-person interview for superintendent. He was, he was in a phone screening but not in an in-person interview. The president of the commission is very upset about that, saying this is supposed to be an independent process and they have no business, the aldermen don't have any business interfering. Do you think there was anything improper about the 19 aldermen writing a letter saying that Brian McDermott should have been interviewed? As you know, the city of Chicago worked hard to come up with a, an independent process um, that would ultimately provide the type of recommendations that are free from to the best of government's ability, that, but that are free from political malfeasance. And so I'm grateful that there's an ordinance in place, but also I do recognize that older persons, just like anyone else, has, should always have the ability to express their thoughts about any decision. Now again, it is an independent body. And I'm going to continue to trust the people of Chicago um, that as we go through this process that there will be recommendations um, that will be made, um, again, that speak to our ultimate desire, which is to have constitutional policing and someone at the very top of the department um, that reflects those values. So they had a right to speak out then? It's a democracy. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, I mean, so thank you for that question, though, Fran. Mayor, how are you? I'm doing well. I noticed that there are a lot of men who are using shea butter for their hair. Are you one of them? No. 
No. Lots of other product, not shea butter. That might explain it then. Yeah. Use shea butter, Craig. <laughs> if, if you shea so. <laughs> On a serious note, I just want to follow up on what Fran had to say about this search process, uh, if you don't mind. Does this raise any concerns with someone with Brian McDermott's experience, 28 years, chief of patrol, uh, well-respected? Um, if somebody like that does not get an interview, does this raise concerns about what qualifications that the search committee is actually applying to those candidates that they'll eventually send to you for three finalists? You know, look, I have not looked at um, they're the list, right? So, I mean, I don't know um, who the finalists are, so I, I can't make that determination. I mean, I, I don't know how many people who will be recommended that have similar experience or experiences as, as Chief McDermott. Look, I've had a great, um, I've had multiple conversations with, uh, with Brian McDermott. I think he is an incredible, fascinating human being. Um, he has, he's well-versed. I'm um, in his role, and he has served this department honorably, you know, and um, I, I believe it would not be appropriate for me to make any determination about a criteria um, or a rubric um, that this particular independent body has the full authority to make those determinations. Hi, Mayor. Hey, Alice. Um, should the CPS board approve a contract next week that would fund the presence of school resource officers in high schools, and why or why not? And I have a follow-up. Sure. Could you repeat that question one more time? I think your enthusiasm and the speed, somehow I lost translation. Oh, no worries. I'm a fast talker. Um, should the CPS Board of Education approve a contract next week with CPD that would fund the presence of school resource officers in high schools for another year? So as you know, that the decision for uh, school resource officers, um, decisions around sc school resource officers has been um, given to the authority of the local school council. Now, what I've said repeatedly is that it's important that we recognize that our children are overwhelmingly being raised in communities where there's a great deal of a trauma that has been untreated. And of course, we have had historically, you know, very damning budgets that have harmed our special education students as well as our English language learners. So I think it's important that as a city, we recognize that our priorities have to be in the development of the full child, you know, and a budgetary decision that ultimately will come down to whether or not a local school council believes that's the best pathway forward. Um, I support LSCs and the democratic process that has been established through that particular means of government. And on the uh, migrant story, um, has your administration spoken with Governor Abbott or with the NGOs in Texas or anyone else around the border who has been in charge of busing or flying these migrants to Chicago? And what was the substance of the conversation? So our, our, our team over the last, what is it now, Ronnie, 37 days? I don't even know how long I've been mayor. It's been 37 days. We've had multiple conversations with um, individuals at the border to get a better understanding of what's going down there. If you're asking me if I've had a direct conversation with a governor, um, I've only spoken to one so far, and that's Governor Pritzker. Uh, you know, if you're recommending that I speak to other governors, um, I'm happy to talk about that offline. But we have a pretty clear picture of what's happening right now. And what's happening right now is that cities like Chicago, um, who have established sanctuary, um, we are working diligently to meet the demands of this moment. But it's going to require the federal government, the state government, county government, local government, the faith community, again, the business community, the philanthropic community. It's really going to take all of us to come up with um, wholehearted solutions that meet the demands of families who have been starved out of opportunities for decades now, while also making sure that we are responding to the newly arrivals. Um, and so my administration um, is dedicated to collaborating and bringing people together. And though we do know that there are individuals that are working tirelessly um, to create political division, 
we're committed to uniting the city as well as uniting this country by being an example here in Chicago. Thank you. Hi, Mayor. So after what happened last night where hundreds of teenagers vandalized a gas station, several cars uh, near 31st and Michigan, what is the plan to prevent this from happening again, and how are you planning to work with the community to resolve this issue? So as you may know, that there has historically been a trend of large congregants of individuals from around the region, not just Chicago, because everybody wants to be in Chicago, um, to congregate downtown on the beaches. Now, you may have not even recognized this, but for several weeks, you have not heard any incident in the news about these congregants because we have been working strategically with law enforcement along with other preventative um, agencies to redirect um, these individuals who in some instances don't mean us any good. Um, I'm grateful that there has been a collaborative approach um, to curtail these type of gatherings that have led to chaos. So we're going to continue to work with community groups, as we have been doing, along with our police force um, to get out in front of, of these trends. And um, I'm very uh, humbled by the strategic work that has been done up until this point um, to reduce the incidents like what was described last night. But clearly, these challenges do not go away overnight. Much like um, my weight, which I'm working on that. And as long as we're diligent, and making sure that we're doing everything in a healthy way, I'm confident that our results will be better. Um, a few weeks ago, an organization created a new initiative called Parents for Chicago, where supposedly parents and Chicago Police Department were going to receive um, text messages or emails alerting them that these uh, huge gatherings were going to be happening. So this afternoon, we reached out to CPD asking them about this initiative, and they said that they had no idea that even existed. What can you tell us about it? There are a lot of new ideas that are being um, lifted up in this moment, and um, we're prepared and willing to work with all of our stakeholders, as I've said repeatedly, um, that are committed to building a better, stronger, safer Chicago. Thank you. Hey, Mayor, um, I have a question and then a follow-up. So last night, Tara Stamps was appointed to, to fill your old seat. Um, first, can you comment on that? I, I mean, I'm sure it must be nice to see a former mentor take your seat. And also, I, I understand that you you kind of made the, the committee men selecting that or choosing her that she was your favorite candidate. Can you kind of speak on her appointment and, and your involvement in the process? Well. Everybody wants to be a Cook County Commissioner now, apparently. <laughs> I mean, I believe there were several people who were vying for that vacancy. The Cook County government um, is a remarkable body of government, and I enjoyed my time there. And the work that we did um, in a collaborative way is something that I will always cherish and remember. As you know, Tara Stamps uh, was my mentor teacher when I taught seventh and eighth graders at Jenner Academy and Cabrini Green. But more importantly, Tara Stamps is a daughter of the city of Chicago. Her mother, Marion Stamps, is one of the individuals that's responsible for electing the first black mayor. I mean, her mother was, was Chicago, an incredible organizer. Um, there's a really interesting story that I'll just abbreviate. When Mayor Harold Washington was um, not as convinced yet on whether or not he should do it, and we know that he put forth the standard of what it would take for him to run for mayor. Um, the truth behind all that was he got an earful from, uh, from Marion Stamps. I mean, that's who Tara is. I mean, she's a part of a rich history in the city of Chicago that has led to some of the greatest transformations that we've seen in government. 
We are a sanctuary city because of Mayor Harold Washington. Mayor Harold Washington exists because of the legacy of the stamps in this city. And so she's going to be just fine. In other words, the first district in Cook County are in good hands with tar stamps. And congratulations to her. And then, uh, you know, there's a similar um, nomination appointment process coming up to, to fill the state senate seat of your firm current chief of staff or deputy chief of staff. Do you plan to get involved and make known who you would like to see appointed? My understanding is that um, uh, the same progressive backers that, that put you in office and helped you elect you are, are making it known that they, they believe they can win that seat. If they're not appointed to it, they can win it through the election. Do you plan to, to endorse someone in that, in that appointment process? Well, the progressive movement certainly is on a roll right now, aren't we? Because that's what the city of Chicago deserves and wants. Um, you know, look, I, I did not interfere with a process that is democratically ran. Those committee persons made a decision based upon the choices that were in front of them. Now, of course, I think it's important that the people of Chicago and throughout Cook County vote, we vote our values. And so identifying individuals that reflect our values in this moment, um, it's incumbent upon the process to identify um, individuals who speak to the, the energy that we're all experiencing right now, the positive energy. So whether or not you know, I get myself involved in endorsements, um, we have not made that full determination. But what I can say is um, don't bet against me. Is that it? Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.